Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to give you a, a warning that I was a chief economist for the oil and gas company for 25 years. So keep that in mind when you hear my remarks. Um, not that I'm biased, I'm actually fairly open-minded about what the future may bring and what has to be done to uh, reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But well, I'm working on a study at Columbia on peak oil demand. And part of what we're looking at is the transportation sector. And one of the things I did was a survey of 15 different forecasts of electric vehicle penetration. So I'm going to be showing you in my presentation some of the survey results in terms of how far do you get and in what time frame. I also wanted to give an overview, really, of all the issues I see trying to understand what impact um, these new changes in the transportation sector will have on oil demand. So I'm, I'm afraid you saw a slide slimmer to this already, but I just wanted to point out that the passenger vehicle sector is only 26% of the oil demand barrel. So it is possible to have decline in that sector and still have growth in oil demand. And in fact, as uh, John has already mentioned, if you look at where the growth is intended to be, it's not the passenger vehicle sector. It's in freight uh, movement, petrochemical feed, feedstock, and aviation. And those things are harder to electrify. There's substitutes are more costly and challenging. So what are the drivers of EV penetration? very strong government drivers. It's becoming more and more expensive to reduce fuel economy in cars, and some governments are actually trying to reverse those standards. Um, meeting CO2 targets in Europe is going to be difficult without it. And of course, you're starting to see more and more countries put bans on sales of fossil fuel cars. And I would argue it's probably going to be more cities doing that that's going to be a bigger policy driver going forward. And I think China is the biggest driver of all because they are using multiple policy levers, some of which we've already heard about, to drive alternative vehicle um, um, penetration. Um, reducing air emissions and clean, clean air in cities is probably the biggest driver as well as carbon. But I also think that besides balance of trade and energy security, because they're a large oil importer, Industrial policy might even be the biggest driver. Just like with solar panels, they want to be the largest seller of EVs and batteries in the world, and they're making this an industrial policy. So for those reasons, I see a lot of movement in this space. And of course, we have declining battery costs, and my, the next panelist is going to talk more about batteries. But I just wanted to say that they're still not competitive with internal combustion engine. And so one question I asked in my survey was, when do you think they'll get down to the magical $100 a kilowatt hour, which a lot of people believe makes them competitive with the ICE? And my survey said the mid-20s. Now, there were some outliers before that and below that. One thing, though, that there's little agreement on is if and when you see solid state batteries. So I'm hoping the next panelist could actually shed light on that question as well. But one thing that is a concern is reducing battery costs is struggling against rising metals prices. And yes, you're finding a way to substitute out of cobalt, but there's going to be a lot of mine expansion involved in producing the sort of levels of metal requirements that these vehicles give. So that's a whole other area of study which is of interest. So on to my survey. Um, the, the chart on the left is showing you annual sales of EVs. And to give you the idea of what the colors mean, yellow is an oil company, red is a government organization, green is a two-degree scenario, which could be an oil company or a government or any of the other categories, and other are consult consultants and investment banks. And you can see there's a wide range of views out there about how much EV sales can grow. But one thing I wanted to point out is there really isn't much volume in 2020. If, if the interest is oil demand, you're not going to be able to reduce oil demand much if you have very little sales before 2020. It's, it's just not at scale. If you look at the chart in the middle, it's EVs in the fleet. And there, you, it takes even another decade to get to any kind of material level of EVs in the fleet given that um, cars on average in the US and Europe are held 11 years, and it may even be 15 to 18 years internationally. So you see it's really 2030 before you start to see a material amount of electric vehicles in the fleet. 
And the last chart is showing you the percent of uh, EVs in the fleet. And if you go to 2040, when you had a, really had a chance to have opinions um, sp spread, there's clearly a divergence in views between people who are in the business as usual scenario versus the two degree carbon scenarios. You know, anywhere between 15 to 60 percent of the fleet in 2040. And that makes a huge difference to oil demand. It's the difference between two and a half million barrels a day of oil demand lost uh, to nine million barrels a day, and actually with one outlier at 16 million barrels a day. So you can see there really is no agreement in the forecasts that are out there. One question I do have in the two degree scenarios, are they really, are these scenarios really what they think is going to happen? Or is this really telling us what is required to get on the true two degree trajectory? And when you see what's required, you realize what a large leap, what has to happen to get on that trajectory. And just to show you, not everyone submitted forecasts of the absolute level of passenger transport demand, but today it's about 25 million barrels a day globally. And no one really expects it to grow, maybe a little bit of growth between now and 2030. And even without electric vehicles, it wasn't going to grow much because fuel efficiency improvements are offsetting a lot of the growth in developing countries. So again, there's really no upside and there's only downside. And in the two degree scenarios, obviously you see significant downside. The next question is autonomous vehicles and how will they impact energy and oil demand? And of course, there are two schools of thought, at least two. Uh, one is that you have an increase in vehicle miles traveled, which is not curbed by governments, and you double uh, your energy consumption. The other school is you don't completely have full automation, and governments do uh, to put constraints on, uh, on how many or single occupancy of vehicles, and you can have a decline of 45% in energy demand. And of course, there's reasons to believe that you'll get a lot of uh, fuel efficiency improvements. You'll have um, uh, you efficiency from echo driving, from platooning, although I would argue you don't really get the benefits of platooning until there are only these alternative vehicles on the road, because otherwise you won't have a, your own lane for these, these cars. Uh, right sizing of vehicles for purpose. There's lots of reasons why you think the cars will be more efficient. Also, I believe they're more likely to be electric. It's much easier to control an electric vehicle if the, the engine is electric. But I think more importantly, these are not going to be owned by individuals. They'll probably start out as fleet vehicles and ride-sharing fleets. And cities will require these fleets to be electric for, uh, for clean air purposes, in my view. However, I do think that the vehicle miles traveled impact is going to be greater than the efficiency impact. Also, the fact that you could have new users, like the old, the young, the infirm driving, who weren't able to. So I wanted to give you some statistics on ride hailing to see that really, if you, if you make it autonomous, you're going to exacerbate the effect. But ride hailing in general is increasing vehicle miles traveled. If you look at annual ridership, it's gone up so much, and it's, it's more than offset the lost taxi miles to the point that this year, New, the New York City Council uh, passed legislation to put a moratorium on new ride hailing uh, services. And I know there's someone from Lyft here, so I expect them to jump in in the, uh, the Q&A. And about 60% of these ride hailing services are thought to come from either taking it away from mass transit or the person would have walked, bicycle, or not gone at all. So we really are adding new travel. And in the nightmare scenario, people could actually, if it's an autonomous car, they could actually have it drive them to work, send it home, and have it come back and pick them up. Therefore, you've doubled the amount of vehicle miles you're traveling. Delivery vehicles, you know, what if Amazon delivered within the hour? It could be a drone, it might not be a vehicle at all, but my point is you clearly are inducing new demand. And it's so autonomous, you're taking the driver cost out, so you're making it even lower cost and more convenient to uh, get to where you're going. Um, a lot of people believe that government policies about, for example, taxes on single occupancy will be needed to curb that demand, 
but these policies are probably not going to be popular with consumers. And in fact, New York City has been fighting New York State for quite some time just to get congestion pricing uh, for traffic in New York City. So it is difficult to get these things done. So some observations. Obviously, the timing is very uncertain and how much penetration you're going to get for electric vehicles. But there's clearly hurdles that need to be overcome. One is how long it takes to turn the fleet over, investment in charging infrastructure. I really haven't talked about that. A recent Goldman Sachs study indicated it requires $3 trillion to invest in the electricity infrastructure needed if we went to full penetration globally of electric vehicles. And most of that is investment in the grid. It's not in generation capacity. Also, there are some countries, India being one of them, where the power supply isn't reliable. So you would have to deal with those issues to actually have this be a global phenomenon. Battery costs are not yet competitive with the internal combustion engine. Therefore, subsidies are still required. And one thing I haven't mentioned is the uncertain value proposition for consumers. At the turn of the century, in about 20 years, everybody moved from electric vehicles to the internal combustion engine because it was a better mousetrap. They were building highways outside of cities, and suddenly you had a, a city car that wasn't capable of that range. So it made sense. And also you had electric ignition coming in. You didn't have to crank internal combustion engine cars anymore. So it made a lot of sense for everyone to want to switch in a short period of time. It's not obvious what the driver is going to be now. Yes, if everyone can drive a Tesla Model S, I suspect that they might, you know, I might buy one tomorrow. But for the mass vehicle, what is going to be the big driver that makes people switch, except for government policy telling them they have to buy a, a non fossil fuel vehicle? And finally, as I mentioned before, ride hailing services and particularly autonomous ones are likely to encourage more travel. So coming from the oil industry, I have to leave you with one thought. You know, even if there's a perception, and, there, and governments and the media really put this view out there that there's going to be an overnight change to electric vehicles, that alone is going to cause underinvestment in the oil and gas industry. Why do I think that? Well, just last week, Goldman Sachs issued a report saying the, the oil majors needed to switch to alternatives because their market was going away. So what that means is they're going to, um, you know, they're going to encourage companies to uh, invest in things other than oil and gas, or to um, have share buybacks, give shareholders the money back, and not invest in their main business. And this will result in probably insufficient oil and gas supplies, and probably much higher prices at some point in the future. So there are dangers in false overestimation of the speed in which this transition could occur. And I'll, I'll leave it at that, and thank you.